All right, Acts chapter 12, verse 1 through 11. The word of God today reads from the King James text. Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it please the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter was there, therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. And the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. And he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise, up quickly. And his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garments about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angels and hath delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. We live in a time of great and treacherous spiritual confusion and rampant false teaching. The Word of God told us that this time would come. It's not like it caught us by surprise, or at least anyone who knows the Word of God should not be caught by surprise. The church has been led down the road of carnal ideologies and worldly thinking. What in truth today is white, many are calling black. Mm -hmm. What is up is today being called down, and truth is being called deception. Mm -hmm. The church has been so swallowed up by Satan's devices that we stand on the precipice of losing millions of souls to the fires of hell as the church fights wars it has no business fighting and it refuses to enter wars to which it has been called to fight the church many in the church I don't want to say the whole church but far too many they don't even know who the enemy is and what the enemy looks like. Never mind how to fight the real enemy. So when you have a misconstrued idea of who the enemy is, after all, the enemy is that lady going in for an abortion or that abortion doctor. The enemy is that gay or lesbian person, according to so many. When you have this screwed up notion in your head, then you find yourself fighting the wrong battle because you're fighting the wrong enemy. Am I telling the truth? Right. I'm going to tell you something. The devil is laughing 
himself to death as the church is pushing more and more and more people away from the cross of Calvary. Amen. When we're supposed to be calling them to the cross. Mm -hmm. right. Oh, God help us, folks. I'm telling you, I, I hope to God this ministry, this church, never loses sight of our true calling and our true responsibilities. There was a time in the church of the living God when the life of the church, the blood that ran through the veins of the church was the prayer warrior. Those people in the church who were able and willing and knew how to devote themselves to urgent, effectual, fervent prayer. The Word of God said the, the fervent, effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And there was a time in the church when the most godly members of the fellowship were able to find their way to their knees and seek the face of God on a regular basis. See, not everybody in the church has the same amount of time available to them. Not everybody. See, this is one thing that annoys me about growing up in the Pentecostal church as I did. Preachers get up and preach and they always acted like every one of us had the same schedule and the same opportunities. And it's kind of like politics, you know. We've got certain politicians trying to tell everybody, well, we all have the same opportunities. We, everybody that wants to go to college can go to college. Everybody that wants a job can find a job. Everybody that wants to support their family can support their family. This is America after all. No, that's a very simplified way of looking at everything. Well, I'm gonna tell you a little secret. The church has been every bit as guilty as the political world of simplifying everything. It's one reason why the church doesn't get LGBT issues because they've simplified the causes of sexual orientation and gender identification. Oh, let's just make everything simple. Let's just make everything black and white. That makes it so much easier to preach about and so much easier to deal with. Well, that would be wonderful if we lived in a world that was that easy, but we don't. Sexual orientation and gender identification, even, this, even the issue of abortion, which I will tell you, I don't like abortion. I'm not a fan of abortion. I don't encourage it. I don't promote it. I don't support it, to be frank and honest. But I'm not going to stand in condemnation of anyone who chooses that route because I'm not living in their shoes. I don't know what's going on in their mind. Their decision is between them and their God. They're going to stand before God in their judgment. So my opinion on the subject, Johnny, doesn't mean a hill of beans. Amen. Right. So easy to simplify things and say, Oh, God's people ought to pray an hour a day. I remember as a kid, you know, Preachers, oh, we ought to read the Word of God at least an hour a day. We ought to be on our knees praying at least an hour a day, you know. And they would always put these religious timetables on everything. Because you remember I preached a while back, religion is about generalizing rules and regulations for everybody. That's what religion is. Rather than understanding that we all walk a personal walk. We're all responsible for a very personal walk with God. It's not about adhering to some list or set of rules and regulations. No. It, each one of us has a different journey. Each one of us has a different walk. Well, I'm going to tell you something. There, there were people in the church when I was growing up who were retired and older, you know. And man, I mean to tell you, they'd hit their knees and they'd be on their knees for hours and hours a day because they had hours and hours to devote to that practice. And those people were what we referred to in the church as prayer warriors. 
Man, I mean to tell you, Bill, when you needed prayer, if you were sick, if you were struggling, if you were going through a divorce, if you were having a hard time at your job, if you were facing a final exam, whatever struggle, if you were having relationship issues, if you were having financial trouble, no matter what problem you faced, you could go to Sister Dow or you could go to Sister McLean. Or you could go to this one or that one and you'd say, oh, please, when you pray, remember me. And you knew, you knew that when you asked them for prayer, they were going to go to prayer. Mm -hmm. They weren't just going to look at you and say, oh, yes, dear, I'll remember you. And then walk away and forget you asked for prayer the minute that they stepped away from you. No, they didn't do it. They were prayer warriors. And when people handed them something to pray about, honey, that was like handing a piece of meat to a lion. <laughs> Man, they grab hold of that prayer and request, and I mean they would get before God and they would pray for you, whatever your need was. And I mean they would pray like you were their mom. They would pray like you were their son or their husband. They didn't pray like, oh, Lord, this is some little girl in the church I know. No. No, they put their emotion, they put their heart, they put their energy into their prayer life. They prayed for you like you were somebody close to them. That's what we call intercession. That's what we call fervent prayer. And you know what? Next Sunday, here would come Sister Dell, and she'd say, Chuck, how's that situation you asked me to pray about? So you know she didn't forget because she's coming up asking you about it. How many times have you asked the preacher to pray for something and after a while he'll come back to you and say, hey, how's that going? How's your sister-in-law doing? How's your cousin doing? How's this one doing? Why? See, that lets you know that that person was not forgotten. Amen. Amen. But you see, prayer warriors were the lifeblood of the church because the church is a body. God doesn't expect that everybody in the church is going to be able to pray the same amount of time. No, religion expects that because we simplify everything to a ridiculous degree. But God doesn't. God understands we're a body. And every member of the body has a different function and a different purpose and a different operation. There are those in the church who in effect do the majority of the praying for the entire church. Do you follow what I'm saying? See, if you had to jump on your knees and fold your hands in front of your face at the bedside every time you prayed, I don't know what my prayer life would look like. But I know prayer is talking to God. I know prayer is communication with the Lord. And you know what, Johnny? I'll tell you what my prayer life looks like. I don't know about other people's prayer. I know what my prayer life looks like. Let Tommy go to work, I start praying. Let me get in the car by myself, I start praying. Let me find myself walking through the grocery store, walking through Walmart by myself, and I'm praying. See, every time I get alone, I understand and I know I'm not really alone. Hallelujah. God is with me. God is present. He is an ever-present help in time of trouble. And every single time I find myself by myself, I begin to communicate with the Lord. Every time. Say, does Tommy see you pray? No. Ask him. I'm not... Some people, I, I already see some of the religious folk are like, what? Your spouse doesn't see you pray? Nope. Nope. I don't do it in front of him. I know people that were in this church and every time I turned around they wanted me to call a prayer meeting. And I thought, why? The only way you can pray is if we all come together to pray. If we're not all in the same room praying, you can't pray. What's your problem? Why, why do you need a prayer meeting in order to pray? Hello now. The Bible said when you pray, go into your closet. That's what Jesus said. Hello now, am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. He said, get alone. Hello now, is that what he said? He said, pray in secret. 
Pray alone. Pray in quiet. Don't, don't pray in front of others. Don't make a show of your prayer life. We used to have somebody in our church who always bragged about a sister that he knew from a church he attended years ago. Oh, bless God, I'll tell you what, bless her. She was so amazing. She was so wonderful. Because it didn't matter what time of day you went to the church, you'd find sister so-and-so up there at the altar praying. Hallelujah. Oh, she'd pray six hours a day, eight hours a day. Really? And how do you know that? Well, because she did it where everybody could see. Hello now. She did it where she was visible. She did it where everybody knew where she was. And if you went in the church at noon, she was there. If you went in the church at 2, she was still there. If you went in the church at 6, she was still there. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Got news for you. That's not the prayer closet. Prayer closet does not mean you literally have to walk into a closet, nor does it mean you have to have a room set aside for God. It simply means you're alone with God. Do you hear what I'm telling you? And every time I'm alone, I'm not alone, but I am alone with God. God. Hello now. And when I'm alone with God, I have a bad habit. I start talking to him. Might be because I'm one of them kind of people can't shut up anyway. I don't know. Tommy, don't you so much as smirk. I talk to the Lord constantly. I pray for everybody in this room. I pray for Martin. I pray for Lisa. I pray for Penny. I pray for People who haven't been part of this church in years. People who left in a huff because they got mad at the preacher for preaching something that they were just hell-bound and determined I preached because they were sitting in, in the room. And that didn't have nothing to do with why I said what I said. But they left the church mad because the preacher dared to say something that really hit a mark. And they didn't like it very well. Well, I got news for you, folks. The Holy Ghost will do that sometimes. Yes. And just because we've got a small church, that doesn't mean the preacher's preaching at you. I'm just saying what the Spirit of the Lord lays on my heart to say. If it happens to hit you, oh well, so be it. My grandmother, bless her heart, she was the amen corner in the church I grew up in. And one of her favorite sayings was, Amen and oh me brother. The preacher was preaching and he said something that stabbed her in the heart and caused her conscience to kind of nibble away at her a little bit. She'd acknowledge that it applied to her. She'd say, Amen. And oh, me brother. I agree with what you're saying and oh boy, did it hit me hard. Hello now. It helped a lot of people in the church if they learned to say, Amen and oh, me instead of, How dare you? I'm leaving. Hello now. <laughs> <laughs> Prayer warriors were the heartbeat of the church. Not everybody in the church can spend hours a day in prayer. But those who can should. That's why the Apostle Paul said that widows over a certain age, he said they shouldn't even worry about Remarried. He said, if you're a widow and you're over 70, if you're a widow and you're over a certain age, he said, you ought to just devote yourself to prayer. You ought to recognize God's given you an opportunity to be alone with Him, hello now, for extended periods of time. And the elderly, the widows, can become prayer warriors because they don't have a spouse running around the house that they're having to make coffee for. Or that they're having to draw baths for. Hello now. Or they're having, yes Tommy, or they're having to go get a diet Dr. Pepper for. <laughs> Prayer warriors made all the difference in the world. I'm going to tell you why. Because the church's first responsibility in war the war that we've been called to fight in this world, our first responsibility is prayer. I'm going to tell you, it's a pretty stupid army that fights a battle without ever first calling the general to find out what they ought to do. Hello now. Amen. Hello now. Come on now. 
I don't care, Bill, you were in the armed forces. Jack was in the armed forces. Anybody who's in the armed forces knows when things start happening, do you just start reacting and responding? Do you just make up your mind what you're going to do, or do you look up the ranks? You look up the ranks. You look for the guy that's a captain. You look for a guy that's a sergeant. You look for a guy that's a little higher up than you. and Look at him like, what do we do now? Hello now. And if he's smart, he's going to be communicating with the guy above him. And if he's smart, he's going to be communicating with the guy above him. You don't get a bunch of privates together and they say, you know what, why don't we just go after that hill and see if we can't take that hill over there. No, you don't do nothing until you heard from the general. Hello now. My Lord, have mercy. I tell you, we got too many Christians running around like a bunch of of foolish children constantly trying to do things on their own, trying to fight a battle on their own. Honey, you can't win a battle when you're fighting on your own terms and you're not receiving instruction from the top. You, know. you better listen to General Jesus before you step out. Listen, the Word of God declares in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 8. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. I got news for you, honey. There is not one person in the media that is your enemy. There is not one, and that includes Fox News. There is not one gay lesbian person who is your enemy. There is not one abortion doctor who is your enemy. Nor are they the enemy of God. You've got to have a pretty stinking weak idea of your God when you think people can be an enemy of God. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you my understanding of the God I serve. <laughs> there ain't a human being on this planet that could come anywhere near standing in opposition to Him. Let Him try. And we'll see how long they continue to breathe God's free air. Hello now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a, I remember a church that I was part of years ago in East Texas. And there was a man on the church board. And he was the most obstinate, obstructive. Every time the pastor felt a direction from the Lord, this man would get involved in arguing and fighting and he would resist every time, Johnny, every time. It didn't matter what the pastor said. He felt like God wanted them to do. This man was going to stand in opposition. Now the Lord called me to prophetic ministry and there are times that I have to do a job I don't much care doing. And one day the Holy Ghost spoke to me and said, I want you to go talk to Brother Allen and here's what I want you to tell him. So I walked into Brother Allen's office. I said, Brother Allen, I've got a word from God for you. He said, what's that, Chuck? I said, you've got a man on your board, and I knew who it was. I called him out by name. I said, Brother so-and-so. I said, that man is literally operating under the influence of the enemy. He is doing everything in his power to hold this church back and to pre prevent it from doing what God wants you to do. And he's in a position to do it because he's on the church board. Now, see, a lot of people, pastors included, their thought would be, well, I just need to knock him off the church board. That'd be all well and good if you were the head of the church, but you're not. Jesus is. I'm going to tell you something, folks. You know, people who don't believe in prayer don't believe in a living God. They don't believe in a real God. If you know how real God is, if you believe God was as real as I know God is, trust me, you'd have all the confidence in the world in prayer. And you wouldn't feel the need to do so much. If these foolish people picketing abortion clinics and picketing gay parades, if those people believed in prayer and believed in God and understood how real God is, let me tell you something, they wouldn't get out there and picket. Because though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Hello now. They'd understand our God is a whole lot bigger than they could ever imagine. So I told Brother Allen, I said, here, I'm going to tell you what God told me. The Lord told me I'm about to remove him. That's what the Spirit of the Lord told me. He said, I'm, I'm going to remove this man. And Brother Allen looked at me and said, well, Chuck, what, what do you mean by that? I said, God told me he's going to remove him. 
I'm not kidding you, folks. I'm not kidding you. Weeks later, this man went out on his front porch to go to work one day, turned around, gave his wife a kiss, turned back around to go to his car, and dropped dead of a heart attack on his front stoop. Literally. His wife, I was there. His wife, not there when he died. I mean, there, you know, when all this transpired. His wife was virtually screaming. He never had any health issues. He was healthy as a horse. He never had a bad heart. I don't understand how this could happen. I'll tell you how it happens. When you get in God's way, God moves you out of the way. But see... We read the story of Ananias and Sapphira in the Word of God and how God struck them down for lying to the Holy Ghost. Well, they weren't lying to the Holy Ghost. They were lying to Peter. Uh, no, they were lying to the Holy Ghost because in the process of telling Peter a fib, they thought God was going to buy the same fib. Hello now. And God struck them down. We, we see the story in Scripture, but we don't believe God's that real today. We don't believe God would do that today. Oh, yes, He will. I'm going to tell you something, church. If we get a genuine understanding of how real and how powerful God is, the, the most potent weapon you have in your arsenal is prayer. Because God can do better and cleaner anything you could ever do. God can get the job done better than you could ever do it. And I got news for you. That's what he wants you to do. Step back, shut up, and let him take care of it. Hello now. Listen, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're not natural. They're not man-made but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Our warfare is not against the flesh. We're not fighting people. Our enemy is not people. And if our enemy is not people, our weapons are not man-made either. Hello now. No, our weapons are spiritual weapons that God has given us. And the most potent, powerful weapon God's ever put in the hands of the church is prayer. He's called us to be prayer warriors. Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, many of us are familiar with this portion of Scripture. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. In other words, put on the whole armor of God so when the enemy comes against you, you don't fall. Now, keep that in mind. Verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Well, that's funny, Paul. You told us that in 2 Corinthians as well. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's who our real enemy is. Our real enemy is principalities. Powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. That's who our real enemy is. So that's the enemy we ought to be fighting, and you can't fight that enemy with man-made weapons. They won't work. Verse 13, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Notice he doesn't say having done all to win. 
having done all to conquer, having done all to defeat the enemy. That's not what he said. He said, having done all, there's one objective. You put on the whole armor of God with one objective, and that is to be able to hold your ground. The whole armor of God, Tommy, is designed to help God's people hold their ground. Listen, verse 14, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Now listen, verse 18. Praying always. Hmm, I'm supposed to put on the armor and then what do I do? Fighting always. No, 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 no. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. I got to take my jacket off. I'm getting awful hot up here today. You'll notice I'm drenched again. You're also blessed you can come to church and dress any old way, but I'm representing the King of Kings, and unlike a lot of preachers in our world today, I don't like getting up in the pulpit looking like I just crawled out of bed. I don't believe in that. I remember years ago I was preaching a revival in a church in Fort Worth. Uh, it was a Church of God of Prophecy preacher who had gone independent, had an independent Pentecostal church, and I was preaching in this church, and we had a marvelous revival. I mean, the attendance literally was like tripling every night. We started out with maybe 20 people. The next night, there were 60. The next night, there was 150. I mean, it was amazing how the audience was growing. And one night after I preached, the pastor's wife came to me. She said, oh, Brother Charles, I've got to tell you what I saw tonight while you were praying. I mean preaching. She said, I've got to tell you what I saw. She said, you were up there preaching, and as you were preaching, I saw these huge, almost look like lawn darts. You know the lawn darts? They're great big 12 or 15 inch, whatever it is. And she said, I saw these huge darts that were on fire coming out of the sanctuary, out of the audience, and they were coming at you. Not everybody in the audience is a believer. Not everybody in the audience wants to hear what you have to say. Not everybody in the audience is wishing you well and praying that God anoints you and allows you to preach the truth with power and authority. No, you got some in the audience who are sitting there just cursing you in their mind. Oh, they're just biting your head off in their mind. And she said, I saw these darts coming out of the audience. She said, they were coming right at you as you were preaching. She said, you're moving across the front of the building. You know me, I can't stand in one spot. If we had a much bigger space, well, you remember in our other space. I move around quite a bit. She said, and as the darts would come within so many feet of you, she said, this huge shield came up. She said, it was bigger than you were. She said this huge shield came up and the dart would hit it and fall to the ground and extinguish it, go out. She said, and I literally saw this happen several times. She said, brother, I'm here to tell you that God showed me you've got faith. And when you're preaching, that faith is serving you well. Hallelujah. It is serving as a shield to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Isn't that what the Word of God said? She went on to say, then I saw the altars in front of the church. She said, I saw fire break out in the altars. She said, all around the altars there was a blaze. She said, God was showing me that the power of God was going to break loose in that place. And it did. The girl I married's brother received the baptism of the Holy Ghost in those meetings. At those altars. 
here to tell you that the armor of God is not designed to help you fight. It is designed to help you survive. Hello now. Think about it. A suit of armor, friend, does not make you a better fighter. Mm -hmm. If you're a coward in a suit of armor, <laughs> you're still a coward in a suit of armor. If you're a talented warrior in a suit of armor, you're a talented warrior in a suit of armor. But that suit of armor does not help you fight any better, does it? Mm -mm. No, it does not. All it does is preserve your life. It helps to uh, make up for those few instances where you may not be looking in the right direction and the enemy tries to stab you or the enemy tries to hurt you. And thank God you've got your armor on because you didn't see him back there or you didn't see him over there. Hello now. And that armor protects you, but it does not make you a better warrior. Everything about the whole armor of God, everything about it is defensive in nature, not offensive. The only weapon we've been given in the description of the whole armor of God is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now I'm going to tell you, people love to wield that sword carelessly. Oh, they love to come up to a person they don't agree with and try to slash them with the Word of God. I'm going to beat you silly with this, bless God. Oh, I'm, this is a weapon God's given me. Uh, yeah, but He hadn't given it to you to use against people because people are not your enemy. Mm -hmm. I'll show you an example of when that sword was wielded and it was wielded well and it was wielded properly. Let's look at Jesus in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. And the devil said, hey, I'll give you every kingdom you see. I'll give you everything here if all you'll do is bow down and worship me. And how did Jesus respond? It is written. Every single temptation, am I telling the truth? Every temptation that the enemy threw at him, Jesus responded, it is written. In other words... But the Word of God says, what was Jesus doing? He was wielding the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And guess what? He was facing the right enemy. Mm -hmm. Instead of telling people off using the Word of God, you need to tell the devil off using the Word of God. I'm going to tell you, when I get down and pray sometime... I'll break off for a minute and talk to the devil for a minute. Devil, I'm going to have a little conversation. You old foul thing, you let go of Amy. In the name of Jesus, I bind every spirit of addiction. I bind every spirit that would try to come against her soul. In the name of Jesus. I talk to the enemy while I'm praying. That's part of spiritual warfare. I use the word of God, but I'm not using it against people. I'm using it against the enemy. Johnny comes to me and says, we're having trouble financially. We just got, we're in a, I'm not saying he has said this. I'm saying as an example, this could be the case. He could say, you know, the enemy is just coming against me in such a way and we don't know how we're going to get out. Johnny, when I get down to pray, I'll pray for you. I'll pray for uh, that need. But then the Spirit of the Lord will inspire me and say, now you need to talk to the enemy about it. So I'll turn around. See, I heard from the general. Now I'll turn around and say, devil! Let your hands off their finances. Let go of their finances. Free them up in the name of Jesus. And before too long, somebody comes to me and says, Hey, you know what? This happened. That happened. This broke through, breakthrough came. That breakthrough come. Oh, I'm going to tell you, if we knew how to pray, if we knew how to be prayer warriors, See, prayer isn't just about going to God and talking to the Lord. No, when you talk to the Lord, you ought to have enough sense to shut your mouth for a minute and hear back from Him. Amen. And I'm going to tell you what the Lord will tell you sometimes. Sometimes He'll tell you, okay, now talk to the devil and tell him this. <laughs> tell the devil this. Sometimes while I'm praying, God will reveal to me, Johnny, that there's a spirit involved, that there's a literal spirit. There's a man in Washington, D.C. right now trying to utterly destroy our country and our democracy. And I'm here to tell you today, God showed me while that man was running for president that he's got any number of demons that are working in him and through him. 
See, I don't see him as the enemy. I see the demons in him working as the enemy. There's a spirit of greed there. There's a lying spirit there. There's a spirit of deception there. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? So you know what happens? When I begin to pray about this person, and I begin to pray about a certain party that's trying to destroy our country today, you know what will happen? God will speak to me and say, Now speak to that lying devil. And tell that lying devil to shut up. And now talk to that old deceptive spirit. And tell that deceptive spirit. And talk to that spirit. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Prayer warriors, folks. Means when you're in prayer, you're in battle. Means when you're in prayer, you're fighting a war. You're using spiritual weapons against a spiritual enemy. This is what God has called His church to be praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. What does that mean? That means if you're praying in the spirit, that means you're praying under the direction and guidance of the spirit of God. Oh, I'm going to tell you the reason most people's prayers don't get answered. If they get answered, they just don't like the answer. The reason most people's prayers get the answer, no, a big no, is because they're not praying in the Spirit. They're not praying according to the will of God. The, Bible, the Word of God tells us that the Spirit of God knows the mind of the Spirit. In other words, He knows His own will. He knows His own purpose. He knows His own plans. When we pray in the Spirit, according to what Paul told us, we pray according to the will of God. I got news for you, honey. God's will may not be what you think it is at all. God's will may not be to overturn Roe versus Wade. I'm going to tell you what I did when I was a kid in high school. A girl in my church, Anita, uh, now her name is Finkel, but back then, uh, I can't remember what it was at the moment, but uh, her married name is Finkel. Anita and I went to the principal of our high school. I think it was in my junior year. And we asked the principal if we could have a pre-before-school prayer meeting on campus, you know, at the high school. Well, Mr. Miller, he was agreeable. He said, absolutely, certainly. So he said, I'll let you have the main office conference room. That's in the heart of the school. Now, mind you, our high school had a principal over each grade. So we had a freshman principal, a sophomore principal, a, uh, or a vice principal, a uh, junior vice principal, and then we had Mr. Miller, who was the senior principal as well as the principal of the whole school, okay? He said, that way you'll be just one door apart from my office. Well, I got news for you, honey. This old boy was raised in a Pentecostal church. When we pray, we don't pray quiet. When we pray, we don't pray, you know, all sweet and gentle and nice. We kind of get a little rowdy. We get a little noisy sometimes because we pray like I was saying earlier. The Word of God said the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. God ain't afraid of me showing my emotions. God ain't afraid of me pouring my heart into my prayer and expressing it to Him the way I feel it. And praying for somebody like they're my grandma or my mother or my sister or my brother or my cousin. Well, we started our little high school pre-class prayer meeting with all of maybe five or six kids. They were all from the church I grew up in. They're in Naugatuck, Connecticut. And as time went by, it grew and it grew and it grew. And before too long, we had about 40 kids in there every morning praying. And I mean, we prayed. We prayed. When I left that high school, in February of 1982, I asked the principal, Mr. Miller, for a reference letter that I could bring. I was moving all the way to Texas. The Holy Ghost told me to come to Texas, so I came to Texas. What do I know? I just do what God tells me to do. Was I scared out of my mind? But I knew God gave me direction, and by God, I was going to do what God told me to do or die trying. And I asked Mr. Miller, I said, I'm going to a new school, and, and they don't know me. And I had asked several people around, including some of my teachers, my pastor, different ones, for letters of recommendation. I said, in case 
when I get to my destination in case uh, a letter of recommendation would help to establish for them who I am and you know what have you. My pastor gave me a lovely letter of recommendation, explained that I had been uh, a children's church director in my church for four years and all this other stuff, you know. And the principal of the high school gave me a letter of recommendation. And in his letter of recommendation, here's what Mr. Miller said. He said, Charles has established himself as one of the most unique students we've ever had in this school. He said the students look up to him as much as or similar to the way they look at faculty. They come to him with problems. They seek counseling from him. See, my nickname in high school was Rev. Anybody that knew me in high school, they called me Rev because I was going to be a preacher and, I, and they knew I was, you know, headed to the ministry and that my nickname was Rev. I had girls come to me who had gotten pregnant. And were scared out of their mind, and they came to me to talk to me and find out what they should do, and and if I and if I would go with them when they went to talk to their mom or dad or whoever, and I would do it. I was a pastor in high school, and I didn't even know it to be honest with you. But he continued telling me in his recommendation letter. He said, "If your school does not already have a prayer meeting for students before class, he said, I encourage you to allow Charles to organize one." Now listen to this. He said, the smoking area in our high school, because we used to have, I don't know about nowadays, but back then we had an area, uh, a hallway, a large wide hallway with glass doors, and the kids could go out into this uh, courtyard and smoke. They actually had a smoking area in the high school. Now that tells you how old I am, because I'm sure they don't allow that anymore. <laughs> He said, in the year and a half or so that they've been conducting the prayer meeting in our school, he said, our smoking area has gone from hundreds of students packing it to smoke cigarettes, he said, to barely being used at all. You want to know the secret? I hadn't even noticed I used to walk through that hall to go to my, you had to go through that hall to get to your arts and what have you, like uh, your uh, art class and to get to your music class, you know, anything that was art related and what have you. And you had to go through this hallway, right? Well, I never noticed, it never dawned on me that there were fewer and fewer students in there all the time. Never dawned on me. Did we pick it, that area, one time? Not one time. Did we say one word about that smoking area to the principal? Not a word. Did we even pray about that smoking area? We never even prayed about it. Never thought of it, to be honest with you. I'll be honest, I never thought of it. But I'm going to tell you something. When God's people learn how to pray, God will do things you're not even expecting Him to do. And all of a sudden, the presence of God in our school grew to the point that fewer and fewer students were used in the smoking area, and the principal noticed that I didn't. I'm going to tell you, folks, you fight a spiritual war. I'm not trying to overturn Roe versus Wade. What I would like to see is, I'd like to see America's abortion rate go down to zero. I got news for you. That ain't going to happen if you overturn Roe versus Wade. That's right. It's not going to go down to zero by no means. But if you believed in a big God like I believe in a big God, if you believed in a powerful God like I believe in a powerful God, then you would understand that if you fight this fight where you ought to be fighting it, instead of in front of the abortion clinics, instead of holding your idiot signs, if you would fight this fight the way you ought to be fighting it, then God would be helping people to make better choices so they don't get pregnant to begin with. God would be helping people who do get pregnant and have the ability and have the stamina to be able to bring that pregnancy to full term and then even give the child up for adoption. See, God can do things you and I can't even begin to do. He can touch hearts. He can touch minds. He can influence people in positive ways. And the whole time, the church doesn't have to come across looking like a bunch of donkeys. Mm -hmm. We don't have to come across looking like we're a problem in the world. Hello now, do you understand what I'm telling you? Oh, I'm going to tell you, the church has been doing this all wrong, people. 
We've been doing this all wrong. The church today is viewed by so many as being a negative influence in our world. So many in the world today see the church of Jesus Christ as being something that the world would be better without. And it's because people are fighting wars they shouldn't be fighting. They're fighting enemies that are not really enemies. And they're using weapons that are man-made rather than spiritual weapons. The Word of God tells us in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 17, Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves. Listen, what did the armor of God help us to do? It helps us to stand. Listen to this. Set yourselves. Stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord with you. <laughs> Hallelujah. O oh, Judah and Jerusalem, fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. God's telling the people of God, you're not even going to need to fight in this battle. See, the battle is not yours, it's mine. The enemy is not your enemy. It's my enemy. If you think you're powerful enough to fight God's enemies, then you're as dumb as the person who doesn't understand how powerful God is to begin with. Hell or hell. Right. I'm going to tell you something. God don't recruit people to fight in His army because there ain't a person on this planet that could do a single thing in His army. There ain't a person on this planet who could accomplish anything. No, we're mighty. Our weapons are what? Mighty through God. Without God in the equation, we might as well give up, throw our hands up in the air, and spend the rest of our days in a prison cell. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. yes. Jude chapter 17, trying to hurry up here today. Jude verses 17 through 21. It's a one chapter book. But beloved, remember ye the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time, who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. The term lusts here simply means their own strong desires. It's not a sexual term. It just means their own desires. If they're worldly and carnal, then they're going to walk after their own ungodly, worldly, carnal desires. 19. These be they who separate themselves Sensual, in other words, they elevate themselves. They, when it says separate themselves, they set themselves apart. If you think that Kenneth Copeland thinks that he's the same level Christian you are, if you think Franklin Graham thinks he's the same believer you are, that he's on the same level as you, you're out of your mind. No, he's up there. He gets on national television. He gets interviewed in national publications. He thinks he's something special. He thinks he's separate from the rest of the church. He thinks he's been set up by God, bless God, to tell the church whatever, what's what and what's white and what's black, what's right and what's wrong. And I tell them the truth. These are they which separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit, but ye beloved, building up yourselves on your most holy faith. How do we build ourselves up on our most holy faith? Picketing abortion clinics, pish, pr, pit, picketing gay pride parades, no. Praying in the Holy Ghost. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Ooh, if saints would only concentrate on keeping themselves in the love of God. Not just, that doesn't mean just keeping yourself where God loves you, but means keeping yourself where you're demonstrating God's love to others. Looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. 1 Peter 4, 7 and 8. But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. And above all things have fervent charity among yourselves. Charity meaning love. Among yourselves, for charity shall cover the multitude of sins. You see, when you love somebody, you don't see their faults. When you love somebody, you don't see their sins. That's why 
I get troubled by people in the church running around always pointing out everybody else's faults and everybody else's weaknesses and everybody mm -hmm. else's sins. Because, honey, the fact you can do that tells me you don't love them like you ought to. Mm -hmm. Hello now, Jesus said, this commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, am I telling the truth. He said, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Peter writes and says, above all things, have fervent love among yourselves, because love shall cover the multitude of sins. I've learned, Johnny, if I just let God's love flow through me, I can love anybody. I don't care what their faults are. I don't care. We've had people come in, and you all know some of the people that have been in this church that if you look at them from a natural perspective, they're not the easiest thing in the world to like, never mind love. <laughs> but you know what? We love them, don't we? And any of their faults, whatever their faults may be, we, we, somehow or another those things just don't really get in our way, do they? No, because when you love, then fall. You let a woman fall in love with a man, that man can be the dirtiest, nastiest old thing that ever walked, and she loves him, she don't see none of that nastiness. She don't see none of that horrible stuff, does she? Right. Yeah, and, and we'll be standing over and say, boy, is that woman stupid. What a dumb woman that is. Look at her, by. she just don't recognize what a foul-smelling, stinking thing that guy is. Well, of course she don't, because she's in love with him. Hello now. Right. If God's people had the love of God flowing through them like we ought to have the love of God through, flowing through us, we wouldn't be looking at one another in the church with judgment. We wouldn't be looking at one another in the church with condemnation. We wouldn't be looking at one another in the church through spiteful, hateful eyes. <laughs> Lastly, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 28. Now, I've I, I got to get back real fast to our primary text. Otherwise, people are going to say, Pastor, you, you ain't even preached on what you talked about, the text you brought out. The church got together. Their response to Peter being in prison was prayer. You didn't see them threatened in civil war like we see in the church today. We got ministers in the church today claiming that if Donald Trump is not re-elected. If Donald Trump's uh, removed from office, bless God, the, the, the church people, God's people are going to rise up! Idiot. Idiot. I-D-I-O-T, in case you don't know how to spell it. You don't see God's people in our primary text today, rising up to break Peter out of jail. You don't see them rising up in insurrection. You don't see them threatening civil war. You don't see them picking up weapons. Even though Herod already has killed some of the followers of Jesus. So Peter's fate is pretty much already sealed. They know what's coming Peter's way. Yet for all that, what do they do? Bunch of crazy people. They call a prayer meeting. I'm going to tell you, I remember a time in the church when a person was diagnosed with cancer, we called a prayer meeting. Somebody lost a job and they had a family to support, we called a prayer meeting. A couple was going through hard times and facing a potential divorce, we called a prayer meeting. We didn't sit in judgment of them. We didn't criticize them. We didn't sit there and try to counsel them and fix their problem. No, we called a prayer meeting because we knew the general would know the way to go. And we knew the general had resources at his disposal. Us five or six privates down on the ground aren't going to be able to do what the general can do because he's got airplanes at his disposal. Hello now. He's got helicopters at his disposal. He's got battleships at his disposal. Right? right? Bill, sometimes you call in air cover, don't you? Because the guys on the ground can't get the job done no matter how much they want to. They don't have the firepower. you got to call in that. Well, if you're going to get that air cover, you better talk to somebody higher up. Because right. ain't a private in your number can get on the horn and call them and say, Hey, send me airplanes. And the, the guy at the Air Force says, all right, then we're sending airplanes because Private Joe Schmo called and said send airplane." No, they've got to hear the order from higher up. Am I telling the truth? Peter wound up being delivered. God sent an angel to deliver Peter from that prison. 
Now here's the problem we have. We got a lot of people in the church, every time we get down to pray, they expect that what they are praying for is going to come to pass. And if it doesn't, well then it's the devil. No, it's not. If it doesn't, then you need to understand God has a different plan and a different purpose. Really, prove that to me by the Word of God. Okay. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 28. I'm almost done going as fast as I can. <laughs> Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more, Paul said, in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, meaning he's been beaten, in prisons more frequent, in deaths oft. Paul witnessed a lot of believers being killed in the process of doing the work God had called him to do. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes save one. That is done with a cat of nine tails, and that is a painful, horrible experience. Why didn't God deliver him? Why didn't God prevent him from having to experience the cat of nine tails. Instead, God allowed Paul to experience it five times. Am I telling the truth? Yes. Thrice, three times, was I beaten with rods. Why didn't God deliver him? Why didn't God prevent him from being beaten with rods? Instead, three times God let him be beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice, three times, I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. My goodness, this man went through an awful lot of negative stuff. I got news for you, church. Sometimes we got to go through a lot of negative stuff. Sometimes it's not about God preventing or delivering us from every circumstance and every situation that we're in. It's not always about God preventing things. It's about for everything Paul went through, he just gave a tremendous list. He came out the other side, didn't he? He's still living. He's still preaching. He's still doing the work of God. No matter what the devil threw at him, no matter what came his way, no matter what God allowed that man to go through, he still came out the other side. But we got a church world today. Oh, no. Everything's supposed to go our way. Everything's supposed to go the way that we believe it ought to go. Roe versus Wade ought to be overturned because that's the will of the church. Yeah, that may be the will of the church, but it may not at all be the will of God. God wants to show what the church can accomplish in the prayer closet, not what they can accomplish in the courtroom. Hello now. Yeah, because when God gets his way and God does it his way, I'm going to tell you a little secret. They ain't a fool in this world don't know it's God. <laughs> Hi, Rose. We're happy to have you watching, honey. Beside those things that are without, Paul said, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Lastly today, listen. The Lord has called us to be people of faith. He's called us to fight our battles in the closet of prayer, not in the arena of public discourse and political activism. He requires us to lean upon his limitless knowledge and his unparalleled wisdom, knowing that those things we ask in prayer which do not come, they're not meant to be. They don't fall within his will. We must return to spiritual warfare and abandon our foolish efforts at carnal battle. We may win a battle fighting in our own strength, but only God can bring the victory that amounts to the conquest in war. Hallelujah. 
In other words, you may win a battle now and again, but honey, if you ain't fighting God's fight, and if you're not fighting in God's way, you're going to still lose the war. We must be today, children, what we have been called to be. And we have been called to be prayer warriors. Hallelujah. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 Would you stand with me this afternoon?